Hey, guys. Hello. Hello. Hey, guys, how are you tonight? Awesome. Hey, it is so great to be with you uh, tonight. Again, uh, my name is Joel. Super happy to be here all the way from Canada. Anybody from Canada? Where are you at? Thank you. Yeah, are you really from there? You're just trying to make me feel good. You are? Okay. Do you know Ralph? It was a test. It's just a test. We don't have that many in Canada. So anyway, uh, super pumped just to be with you guys tonight. Um, yeah, as Scott was saying about 20 years ago, just to give you a little bit so you know who's talking to you. 20 years ago, I got saved running a comedy club in Western Canada. Uh, who, who's seen the TV show Whose Line Is It Anyway? Okay. Uh, I don't necessarily endorse it. But uh, those guys are from, two of those guys, Ryan Stiles, the tall one, and then the bald guy, who I particularly like for no apparent reason. Uh, they're from Vancouver Theater Sport League, VTSL. And so those guys were like my mentors. And when I was 19 years old, wasn't a Christian, moved to a city in Kelowna called, um, uh, to a city in Canada called Kelowna, opened my own comedy club. I was dating a Mormon girl. Uh, we were, we'd been going out four years and um, we moved to the city, opened this new comedy club. It was doing amazing. And then she dumped me. Well, y'all are cold. Someone just cheered. I'm like, come on now. She dumped me. What? You're like, it was 20 years ago. Move on. We're American. We do that. We just move on. Okay. All right. Fine. 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 Anyway, I rebounded. I walked into, uh, I, I, I called up this girl because I, I knew I, uh, something was I just needed to rebound. And so I called her and I'm like, hey, we should go out tonight. She goes, yeah, I'm going out tonight to this thing called Refiner's Fire. And I remember thinking, that's not a church, is it? And she's like, yeah, it is a church, but it's really cool. Anybody else fall for that? She's like, there's a bunch of young adults and you'll love it. So I thought, well, okay, it's not clubbing. I thought we were going to a nightclub, but I went anyway. And at the time I was a DJ for a radio station. I had a TV show and I ran the comedy club in town. And I remember thinking I was kind of, you know, important. I didn't want to get seen or as the Italians say, made at a church. So I snuck into the back. She's like, why are we sitting in the back? I'm like, it's just my style. And I wore dark glasses and I sat on the back row. And, and then I was like, hopefully this way nobody notices me because, you know, I'm a celebrity in a town of 70,000 people. Woo. Anyway, the preacher gets up on stage. He walks out. He opens his Bible. He looks up. There's about 300 people in the room. He goes, hey, great to see everyone here tonight. Hey, Joel Turner's here. And 300 heads turned around and stared at me. I sunk right there in, in the seat. That guy took me out for coffee. He led me to Jesus. I walked back into my comedy club. I called a staff meeting. I had 20 comedians working for me. I said, gather around and, and just pay attention because, look, I could write a book on how to kill a comedy club in three months. I gathered around. I said, listen up. I just became a Christian. We should all get saved right now. <laughs> yeah, so half of them left immediately. Half of the half remained just to see what happened to their weird director. And then the remain, you know, the other five, if you do the math, they got saved. And so I started pouring into these guys. We took out all the drinking, smoking, swearing, alcohol, you know, everything. We basically taught near swears to non-Christian comedians. It was wild. And then what happened was it really took off the largest Baptist church in Canada. The, uh, it was about 3,500 people at the time. The youth pastor had about 500 youth. And he came across the road. He was angry. He said, I want to talk to you. I said, yo, what's up? He goes, I'm not, he goes, I heard you got saved. I said, yeah, I did. Isn't that great? He's like, well, I... It, I have a problem with that. I said, I thought that was a good thing. He's like, it is good, but all my youth are coming to your comedy club on youth night. And I was like, oh, okay. He goes, I heard you clean it up. And so, you know, basically, if you can't beat, if you can't, uh, if you can't beat them, join them. So what did he do? He hired me as his youth assistant pastor. That's how I got into the ministry, folks. So <laughs> just want you to, and six people left right there. They're like, and we're done. Okay. I, uh, I met my wife. I took her to the same young adult service for Finer's Fire. Uh, she was not a Christian, clearly, and I thought, I'm going to take her to the same thing because she's cute. I'm just being honest. And so I took this girl, and I was hoping the same thing would happen, and she started crying, and I tapped her on the shoulder and said, let's go. And I took her into a dark back room. I don't recommend this. <laughs> if you're a young adult, don't be writing that down. You're like, oh, that's what I got from the awe conference right there. No, 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 guys. And I prayed with her to receive Christ, okay? And here's the wisdom part. I gave her 24 hours 
to grow in her walk with the Lord. Before asking her out, because you don't want to rush that. You know what I'm saying? Just some maturity time, and then, and then we went out, and the rest is history. So excited to be here. I'll, I'll admit I've never been asked to speak at a worship conference. In fact, I'm not really that musical. So much so when I, when I got off the phone, I turned to my wife, and she's just kind of the, one of those people. Anybody in here like this or have a wife or a friend like this? She's just a truther, you know? And, and, like, there's no way I struggle with pride. Anybody in here? Because you, you're close to somebody that just cuts to the truth. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Point if you're sitting next to one right now. Yeah, okay. That's my wife. I was excited. I'm like, babe, I just got asked to speak at a worship conference. Her reaction was, what? They must have made a mistake. Why did they ask you? That's seriously what she said. That's her gift of encouragement. And... Uh, She's amazing. She keeps me humble all the time. But I got defensive, and I was, like, trying to remind, and I was, like, making stuff. I'm like, look. She's like, you don't even play an instrument. I'm like, yeah, I do, or I did. I played triangle professionally in a band for 15 years. Uh, you laugh. It was electric. It's quite a commitment. It's at 2,000 volts I had that thing cranked up. But anyway, um, two guys before me are dead. But anyway, it's great to be here. I'm so excited for this. Let's get into our passage. You're like, oh, we are going to get into the Bible. Good. Good. I was starting to pray for you. Okay. Luke chapter 9, verse 28 to 36. You got a Bible, or as I say at my church, push and swipe and turn with me to Luke 9, 28. Here's what it says. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he, Jesus, took Peter, John, and James and went up the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered. His robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those who were with him, heavy with sleep, and when they fully awake, they saw his glory, and the two men stood with him. Then it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, the cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. And when the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone. But they kept quiet and told no one these, those days any of the things they had seen. Father, we pray tonight that you would move by your Holy Spirit and through your word upon our lives. We don't just want another study, Lord. We don't want just another piece of information, but Father, we come tonight because you are a holy God. You are divine and you work in moments, and we ask in this moment that you would divinely visit us and reveal yourself to us right now. God, we want more of you, and I just pray for these people, Lord, as I've been praying, that you would move upon hearts tonight, that your spirit would move upon this place and these individuals for your glory, and that we might be drawn back to the awe of God and the glory of God, and we ask all this in Jesus' mighty name, and all God's people said, shout it out, amen. amen. I live by the Rocky Mountains. Anyone been there? It's called, the area I'm in near the Rockies is called Bear Country, all right? And, uh, and, and the deal is the feared bear of the area is the grizzly bear. Now, that is extinct in California. You don't have them anymore. You used to. But these beasts on their hind legs can be like 10 feet tall if they rear up. That's like two Matt Redmonds on top of each other. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And my wife said, don't do that Matt Redman joke. No, I'm not being mean. I'm just trying to give you the idea of the size. It's like double, right? Like double, double animal style. Okay, that was, that's, yeah, that's for the in and out. I, I heard the comment earlier. Moving on, moving on. <laughs> I eat in and out huge when I'm down here too, so pray for me. Yeah, I heard like a grizzly bear. I just want you to understand this. A grizzly bear can take out a full-grown moose. They're like up to 12 feet long, moose. They are like 1,500 pounds. It's like a grand piano and a half, music people. <laughs> I spent hours finding something in the music world. 
that weighs the same as a moose. I'm like, 13 guitars and the amp box? I don't even know what that is. Okay. Let's just go with grand piano. There's got to be a grand piano person in here. Okay. All right. If you see a grizzly, it's a fearful thing. Every couple years, they come out on the news. The stories don't get better. The news reporters don't know how to make them better. It's like Johnny went out on a run. He got eaten by a bear. There's just no way to say that nicely. He's gone to a better place. May he rest in pieces. We don't know. We, we don't know how to say it. But it's a fearful thing. Well, one day, one, one day me and my family go out for a hike in the mountains. We get in the van, and you have to know this about where I live. If you Google Banff or Lake Louise, not now because we're in a Bible study, but at some point later, you'll see it's gorgeous, it's mountains, but it's freaky. And there is a place called Kananaskas that we like to go hike just down the road. And here's the deal. The signs get progressively worse in this area. The first sign you see says this, you are now entering bear country. And you kind of get that like, Ooh. it's like Mufasa. <laughs> Say it again. Ooh. You are now entering bear. And I, I build it up a little bit and try to scare the life out of the kids. But here's the deal. At the park entrance, and this doesn't always happen. It's a temporary sign. This time going into the park entrance, they have my favorite sign. If it's up, it's a yellow sign. It says bear spotted in area. And then the most redundant, not necessary words ever written on a sign, please be careful. Because <laughs> nobody just goes, oh, there's a bear in the area. Let's be reckless and wear bright pink and run in the bushes. No. I don't know why they say that. But it gets a little freakier, even for me. I mean, I'm used to this. I live there, but it's like, whoa, you feel this extra weight, if you will. And, and then the third sign, if you ever get this, you're in trouble. It's just a sign of children running in a bear with a bib on. And that, no, that's not true. That's not true. <laughs> Don't write that down. What are you doing? It's like a bear. <laughs> okay. But being as I'm a little loco, I'm like, let's take the kids. All my kids are crazy too. And my, my wife's the cautious one. And so we figure, I'm like, kids are like, should we turn back, Dad? I'm like, are you kidding? We have Jesus. Yo, let's do this. So. So we get out, we start hiking, and I'm somewhat used to the level of fear, but my wife likes to remind the kids, make lots of noise. And this is something I'll never understand. They actually recommend in our area, who's ever heard this before? Wearing bear bells. Have you heard of this? Yes, there you go. There's a few of you. All right, you wear bear bells. They're like, you should pick up some bear bells, and you should put them around your neck, or you carry them and ring them above your head as you hike. I think this is the stupidest thing. I refuse to do this. To me, this is like an invitation to bears. It's like ringing a dinner bell. Bears are like chillaxing and they're like ding, 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 dinner time, oh, awesome. And they come down and they're like, and you tell them where you are. I'll never do that, anyway. But we do it like six idiots. We're singing songs, nursery rhymes and my eldest boy and I, Roman, we create this massive gap. And my wife's getting nervous. She's yelling, that's too far. Come back. The gap is too big, right? And so I'm like, well, this is kind of fun. Yet I'm almost positive my wife, she kind of knows if a bear does attack. If we're close together, it's, it's better because he'll probably choose the pot roast over the chicken wing. She's a skinny little, you know. And so anyway, you know, you're like, oh, I'm telling oh, pot roast. Okay. But this wicked thought and fun enters my brain. I'm with my nine-year-old son, so it's a discipleship moment. And, you know, because you train a child in the way. Anyway, and I'm like, I'm like, son, we've got enough time to do something crazy fun. Are you in? And he's like, sure, Dad. So I make a paw print on the path. And, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm not bragging, but it was pretty perfect. It was... It looked just like a grizzly bear, and we're like, okay, we'll make the next one here. And we waited for the family to arrive, and we just, I start screaming like a girl. I'm like, ah, grizzly bear, paw print. And the whole family kind of gets aghast right away. And, and, you know, one of my sons is like man tracker. He kneels down, and he's like, these are fresh. We have three minutes. And, and, <laughs> and so we tie up the slow kit. No, listen. No, it's not what we did. Um, we're just having a bit of fun tonight, okay? Uh, <laughs> concerned parents. Uh, 
No, I burst into laughter. I said, you guys, I'm just kidding. And everybody piled on me, and they're punching me, and they're angry. And, you know, and so we hike along. This is a true story. We hike along for another 15 minutes. And, and all of a sudden, I'm up against boy who cried wolf scenario. Oh, yeah. Because now, I mean, me and my son Roman, he's a little bit in front of me, but everyone else, again, is further behind. And all of a sudden, he's like, Dad. And he points at the ground, and there's ba- bear paw prints. And so I start yelling out, bear, bear. You know? <laughs> my, parents like, my wife's like, nice one. Sure, honey. I'm like, no, really? These are real bear prints. And, it, and it, when they realize I'm not joking, and I'm thinking on the inside, you reap what you sow, you reap what you sow. I'm, I'm getting what I deserve. These are consequences for earlier sins in life, you know. And I'm like, we got to get back to the van. van. And so we run to the van. And we're, now we're not singing nursery rhymes. It's like Matt Redman, when the darkness closes in, you know. Still I will bless the people. And we dive into the van. We get in the van. And I said, let's pray right now. God, thank you for sparing us in Jesus' name. Amen. And right as I finish the prayer, my nine-year-old son, Roman, says, Dad, I have a confession. I said, what? He goes, I did the paw prints the second time. You can't make that stuff up. It's legend in our home. (laughs) And I was like, you are dead. And before I said it, my wife looked at me. Where do you think he got that from, pastor? I was like, okay. All right. (laughs) You can't discipline him. He learned it from me. Friends, the word awe, if you're a note taker, maybe jot this down. It means a feeling of reverential respect mixed with fear and wonder. It is the intersection of dread and amazement. It is the understanding of a greater being in proximity with you. In regard to the Lord in the Greek language, it speaks of a reverence to a mighty God, a fear of God's power, and to stand in awe. Fear is a wonderful motivator. And when you add awe, it's like this spiritual chiropractic adjustment that sets your spiritual spine back in order instantly, adjusting everything and making you realize this is what matters and nothing else. The awe of God. Friends, on the mountain we had fear, joking aside, but it was a fear that motivated us. It changed our actions. It burnt away. Here it is. What didn't matter We were running from something of power. It created an awe of the present power. And that's what I believe in this passage of Scripture God wants to do tonight. We need this in our lives. We need the awe of God in our walk, in our churches, in our home. Amen? And so in the time that remains, I want to just give you three ways to get your awe back. Here's the first one. Got a pen, jot it down, or put it in your notes on your phone. Number one, seek him on the mountain. Look at verse 28, now it came to pass eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went up the mountain to pray. So first get the scene, the disciples are all together at the bottom of a mountain. And Jesus is going to go up what we call the Mount of Transfiguration, this event that took place in history. And, and you have that junior high moment, you know, where you got picked for teams or you didn't get picked, painful for some of you, great for others, you know. And, and people and scholars are weird about this. They're like, well, he chose St. James, St. John, and St. Peter. I don't think it was like that at all. I think he's more like a school teacher going, okay, I'm going to leave these guys. Who can I not leave behind because they'll mess things up? Peter, James, John, you come with me and stay close. That's just my opinion. And so he grabs these guys, and he starts heading up the mountain with them. And it says that he goes up the mountain to pray. And I like this. The mountains, mountains in the Bible are awesome. Mountains in the Bible are where good things happen. When we talk about a mountaintop experience, we have history behind that statement in the Bible. Abraham and Isaac up a mountain, such a monumental moment. David is threshing floor. The Ten Commandments, Calvary, the cross of Jesus on a mountain. There's also bad things that happen on mountains, of course. Sinai was bad. Also, when those young people mocked the bald guy and he summoned bears on them, 
that was bad. Favorite verse in the Bible. Anyway, but mountains are significant. I mean, just te- technically you're closer to God, number one. <laughs> and, and, but really, more specifically, Jesus, we see him often going up the mountain to pray. When the boys were in the storm, he sent them off. He went up the mountain and prayed. He spends nights on the mountain. It's like this picture of, I want to get alone with you. It's God sort of echoing to us, get alone with me. That's what on the mountain praying means. And and that's why we're here, amen? That's the point of this conference, the awe conference, is so that you can do exactly that. Get on the mountain, get alone with God, just you and God and 1,200 other people. But anyway, this is a moment in your life. This isn't just, oh, I should take in another conference. God wants to do something, is doing something, isn't done doing something, amen? But truly, my prayer for you is that God gives you a mountaintop experience. We need this in our life. Now, people often say, well, Joel, you know, <laughs> you, you know, there's always the naysayers, right? They're like, well, that's emotionalism, right? And Emo- we can't trust our feelings. I know we can't trust our feelings, But at the same time, when you get to heaven, what do you think the first thing you're going to experience is? Emotion. It's not a bad thing. God gave it to you. There is a moment where you get close to God. You feel it. You should feel it. And it's it's a place to start here. When I say the first way to get your awe back is to seek him on the mountains, the question I want to ask is, are you feeling your faith right now? They go up the mountain You know, you look through the Bible, you think of Moses. He goes up the mountain and meets with God, and he comes down glowing at no point. If you interviewed Moses or do one day, 100 years from now, is he going to ever say he regretted that? Yeah, we don't live on the mountain. Life's lived in the valleys. But let God do something as you get away with him. Verse 29, as he prayed, I love this, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. Can you see it? This is so cool. The word glistening is an old English word that translates into the Greek, please hear me on this, as lightning flashing. You know, I, other translations of, or other examples of this, we have the other gospels tell us that, you know, his, his, his body glowed, his raiment glowed white. One, one version of it says, whiter than any launderer could get clean on earth. What a great way of saying it. Like you could scrub forever, you'd never beat this. But the real translation is like a glowing lightning glistening off him. I saw the trailer for Thor. He's all like lit up with lightning. Okay, this is the real God of thunder. This really happened, amen? This is the real deal. Hollywood scratches at a Messiah character. And we are staring right at it, him. He's real. He's here tonight, the same one. When he goes to pray, he starts glowing. Let me just suggest this. When you go to pray in your life, you start glowing for the kingdom too. When you start your prayer life, when you get your prayer life back right with God, you're glowing. And when you're glowing, you're growing. And when you're not, you're not. There's something God wants to do tonight. I love this picture that we have. We see him on the mountains. The word word transfiguration is the word metamorphosis. It's the idea that Jesus, something on the inside, produced a change on the outside. Isn't that cool? It was always there on the inside. He was always God incarnate, and the temptation to just blow the doors open at any point and just be that all the time would have been there. But no, in this moment, God just going to peel back a little bit of glory for us. And let us see him glistening on the mountain. I believe what God wants to get your awe back. And he does it by pointing to the glistening son of God, Jesus. And people are like, well, prayer changes things. Yes, it does. But can we say it changes us first? That's the big change. It's you and me. It's not that when I go to pray for things that like instantly they all go just how I prayed. Okay, if you're that person, could you pray for me in my ministry? Anyway, but... You understand what I'm saying, right? It's that God puts me at peace with him, and I can go, Abba, you are in control. None of this garbage going on in my life right now catches you off guard. None of it takes you by surprise. You're not in shock. 
You're not going to Gabriel. Why don't I have an update on this? You're still seated on the throne. Love this verse in the Bible. He says, in the flood, God was seated on the throne. Wow. In the greatest time of chaos, your God sat enthroned. And here we have him, Lord over all, modeling, going up the mountain in prayer. The first one is seek him on the mountain. Second one, how do I get my awe back when it goes away? Number two, get a pen, jot this down. See his glory. Check it out. See his glory. Check it out. Verse 30. And behold, two men walked with him who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Interesting, the word decease is the Greek word exodus. How ironic that must have been for Moses. Let's talk about the exodus. Oh, I got this one, Lord. I was there. No, not that one. My exodus to pay for everyone's sin. You got to really catch this. This is such an amazing moment. Imagine you're invited to the ultimate Christian conference. It's all on the mountain of God with Jesus as your senior pastor. Night one, how'd it go? Can you imagine talking in the dining room? It was amazing. He went up, he prayed glistening, lightning on his raiment, unbelievable. Day one of that conference, hey guys? Day two, you wake up, you're sleepy like you always are after the first night, right? You wake up, you're like rubbing your eyes. Oh, Moses and Elijah for guest speakers today, awesome. Wow. Is it just me? The problem with familiar passages is they become so familiar they lose their power to us? This really happened. On the mountain with God, with Jesus, the awe of the moment. And then you come around like the disciples do here. And it's Moses and Elijah. And can you imagine this moment and the conversation that would have happened between them? Look at verse 32. But Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. It's just a small thing, but it seems whenever Jesus is praying, Peter is sleeping. Have you noticed that? Just a small thing on his report card, but I'm just just saying. And they were fully, when they were fully awake, here it is, underline it, circle it, highlight it. They saw his glory. Wow. And the two men who stood with him. Verse 33, then it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Understatement of the year. (laughs) Night one was epic with you on the mountain, the glowy thing. Awesome. But you're just pulling out the punches. Moses and Elijah? This is good. And then it happened as they were parting. Get the picture. Moses and Elijah sort of turned to go away. And Peter, this is what he says. Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, tents. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said. Okay, time out for a second. I don't know if you thought this before, but how does he know their names? I mean, he was sleeping. But now he's waking up for this amazing first night of his awe conference. Day two, he sees the speakers and he says, let me make some tents for these guys. Let's not lose the moment, Lord. Let's put tents out for you, Moses and Elijah. How does he know his names? There's no t-shirts. With names on Moses, Elijah, right? We would not see any like, hello, my name is Moses, stickers on their chest. How does he know their names? Is Moses carrying a mug that's like, keep calm, carry on crossing the Red Sea? I don't know. How does he know their names? This is what I want you to catch about this because I, I just think it's awesome. You have to grab this because I, I, I want what verse 31 says. Look at verse 31. It says right here. They appeared with him in glory. Verse 32, they fully saw his glory. And so could it be, and I believe it is, that this is their eternal state? Oh, oh, that the roof would peel back tonight that we might see a glimpse of heaven because that's what these guys are getting. They're seeing them in the glorified state. And let me just say this. This tells us about heaven, that in heaven we will instantly know everybody's names. Isn't that cool? Anybody here struggle with names like I do? 
that, you wait till you get to heaven. You're just going to meet people and remember them. Charles Spurgeon comments on this, uh, you know, in one of his commentaries. He said, a lady came up to him once and she said, Mr. Spurgeon, are you saying that in heaven we'll know everyone's names? And he said, my dear lady, put his arm around her and he said, you won't be stupider in heaven than you are on earth. Anyway, I'll leave that with you. All right. It's a taste of things to come in glory. Instant knowledge. So you say, well, Joel, why Moses and Elijah? Well, really, they represent the law and the prophets. And it's cool. Here, the New Testament, Jesus is talking and having perfect harmony, if you will, with the law and the prophets, just like we know he does. And, the, and also, more than that, you could say, these are the two big ones, the big kahunas, the major dudes of the Old Testament, talking with the major man, God himself incarnate in the New Testament. Let me help you. This would be like Abraham, Lincoln, it'd be like George Washington hanging out, talking, okay? And for the one Canadian over there, this would be like Wayne Gretzky and William Shatner. That's all we got, isn't it? I was going to say Justin Bieber, but I thought someone might throw tomatoes. So anyway, this is huge. These are the big guys. And so Peter and his boys are tripping out. They're like, wow, look who it is. Let's make tents and camp out here. This retreat's getting better. In verse 31, they're talking about, and I love this word, it says comp all he's going to accomplish at his decease, his death. And isn't that a good reminder, guys? It, it's, it's his accomplishment. It's what Jesus accomplishes. It's not some accident. It's an accomplishment. It's not an unplanned event. I think he's telling Moses and Elijah, he's like, I'm going to go to the cross and nail this thing. I'm going to take Satan, death, demons, and the grave down. Probably not in those words, but do you know what I'm saying? It's what I will accomplish. I will buy back every single person that commits in faith to believe upon me. I will buy them back from Satan, sin, death, demons, to grave and hell. I'm going to accomplish it at the cross. And if you think I'm off because I'm excited, like, oh, no, I'm sure he was morose, the Bible says it was his joy. For the joy set before him, that's what it says of Jesus. It was his joy to go and rescue you from your sins. Doesn't mean it was without pain, cost, or suffering, but it was his joy to buy you back and accomplish what he did on the cross. He's like, this is going to happen. And these guys, verse 32, they saw his glory. You want your awe back? You seek him. Begin to pray again and get glowing for his kingdom. And then you enter in, you see the glory of God as you look into his word. Never, friends, never get too far away from the glory, the awe of God in your lives. Oh, that we would be those that say, Lord, take me back to my first love. When I first got saved, when I led my wife to the Lord, I remember that same day after she got saved, and she was a bar star. I hope you know what that means. She just like did a 180. She quit men, drinking, drugs, everything instantly. Now, I took her out the first day. We went into a 7-Eleven. You have those, Max? Okay, you're like, we started those. Never mind. Anyway, <laughs> do you have those? Okay. We go into the 7-Eleven. I'm trying to order like a Slurpee for her and me, and she's like telling the guy behind the counter, do you know Jesus? I just met Jesus. You should meet Jesus. I'm like, well, we're in a 7-Eleven. Just order your Slurpee. Can we just get through any? And the Lord's like, don't dampen this flame. I remember that in my heart. Like, whoa. Don't put the reins on her because that fire comes from me. Have you forgotten your first love? Do you still have that awe that you had in the early days? C.S. Lewis writes, a man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the walls of his cell. The glory is always there. It's just you don't always access it. The glory is undiminished. It's just you're not always seeking, seeing, and sharing in his glory. But there's a warning in this part right here. Guys, why? Because these guys were sleeping when they should have been seeing. They fell asleep. And we do that too. 
Tonight, some of you, perhaps, you're sleeping spiritually. Maybe this during this conference, you're waking up to the awe of God. You're seeing him. You're seeking him. But God wants more. He wants you to see his glory. I believe that. And he is real here tonight. This is not just like, oh, it's a sermon I've done 19 times. I literally, in the lodge over there, the stone lodge, was on my knees crying out for someone in here. I don't know who it is. This afternoon, I was like, God, get someone back to the glory of God tonight. I don't know who it is, Lord. Someone needs to come back. I mean, this is a real thing, right? It's not just a set up thing. Like, oh, now this is the part where they preach. No, no, this is my heart. If you please hear me. This is real. God loves you. And he wants you back right with him. You know that area he's touching on in your life. And, and you, he wants you to just come and get back right with him. What do you need to wake up to, to be in awe of God again? What do you need to snap out of? Is it spiritual laziness? Is it apathy? Is it mundane ministry? Is it dull devotions? Is it sin? Well, stay with me. We seek him. We see his glory. And then lastly, number three, how do we get our awe back? This is a big one. You separate yourselves. We separate ourselves. Watch this. Peter has this classic line where he says, no, 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 no. Let's make tents. Everyone hang out. One translation says he blurted it out. In verse 34, while he's saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. This is so awesome. They were overshadowed with the cloud of God's glory. What the Old Testament calls the Shekinah glory cloud. This is the same word used of Mary when it says she's overwhelmed or clouded over. In Luke 1.35, the glory of God comes upon her and she receives the child Jesus. There's a cloud coming over you tonight and it will point out something. It will point out where you're sleeping. It will point out where you're not seeking, but it will also point to Jesus and his grace to return to him. It will also point to his forgiveness that is there for you tonight. The Shekinah glory, David Guzik writes, as the glory intensified, it began to create an awe in them. And a dread at the same time, that's what it is, that sinners feel when we're in the presence of the living God. The awe of God. Verse 35, the voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. And when the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone. I love this part. Friends, <laughs> first I think it needs to be said, if you don't know what to say, don't say anything, right? Peter's like, uh-uh. It's just better not to. There are holy moments. Would you, would you not agree? I am notorious. I'm guilty of this. There's a holy moment, and I'm just bursting because I'm like, ooh, I've got a joke I have to say right now. Anybody identify? Thank you. There's my brothers and sisters. All right. But, and, and I've been blessed by a wife who will kick me at the right time now. And say, not now. That's what the Lord is doing here. The Scot in the uh, in the NSV, the New Scottish Version, it translates, "Shut it." Anyway, anyway. Sorry, it's actually, "Ach, shut it." All right. <laughs> if you don't know what to say, it's better to shut up. Peter should have just shut up. And often, what is happening is God is trying to speak to us, give us a taste of His glory, but we move so quickly, do we not? We blurt out, we change the topic, we're like, oh, that's getting too personal. Maybe you're doing it tonight. And I do this, I'm like, oh, this is an awesome moment in creation with my family. Look at the mountains. Let's get a selfie. And sometimes I just need to like stop and just soak it in. And that's Peter. Peter's this guy right here. And I love what happens here. Friends, the voice that comes out of the cloud is still here tonight. And he's saying this, listen to my son Jesus in your life. Maybe you need to hear that. See why? Because there's a problem sometimes we don't hear his voice. And here's what I think it is. I love in verse 36 it says, when the voices ceased, Jesus was found alone. 
the cloud comes over. Peter's in awe. Moses, Elijah. God goes, no, 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 Jesus. Cloud, boom, the others are gone. And it's Jesus alone. He does that in our life, does he not? When you start focusing on something that is not God, when you let something else rise up in competition to stand on either side of God, even a good thing like your ministry. Oh, my ministry. (laughs) My ministry. Well, Joel, my gifts. I have these gifts. I mean, Chris Tomlin's good, but my gifts. Aren't we funny? I mean, they're just tools he gave us, right? I mean, I, I'm an evangelist at heart. I go around strengthening other churches. Call me. I'm out of work right now. No, anyway, listen. <laughs> it's free. No, okay. But <laughs> that, that's what I do. But I'm not like, oh, my gift of evangelism. I mean, I don't even get to do my gift in heaven. A hundred years from now, I'm done, right? I'm out of a job. <laughs> Have you heard about Jesus? Uh, yeah, he's right there. <laughs> I'll, I'll just be in the back then with the... Uh, just be in the back with the other guys, the other evangelists that were so cool on earth. No, like, <laughs> we had such a moment. Yeah, okay. God makes it impossible for Peter and others to focus on Moses and Elijah any longer. He clouds over the competition in your life. He shuts down things that are in competition in your life because he loves you. And he will not share his glory. Because he loves you. And if you lost something valuable recently, you're like, oh, but this girl, Joel, this boy, this job I had, that car, that house. Just remember, what does it do? We share in his suffering. The Bible says that we can share in his glory. We suffer and then we go, gosh, I guess it wasn't that person, that job, that ministry, that opportunity. Why did I get overlooked? Why did that person jump in front? I guess it wasn't that. Because it's you, Jesus. And we think, oh, you know, I delight yourself in the Lord. I'll give you the desires of your heart. We, we pre- people preach this wrong all the time. They're like, so it's a contract. If I delight in him, then I get this. And they're like, oh, no, 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 that's wrong. And the second way to interpret it is if I delight in him, if I really delight in him, then he'll give me this. That's still wrong. The right way to interpret it is this. If you delight yourself in the Lord, he does give you the desires of your heart. You know what they are? They're him. Pretty soon your desires become him. Not what he'll give you, just him. The rest is all bonus. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things are bonus. Thrown in. He takes care of your wife, your husband, your car. It's because you got your eyes off Jesus like Peter did You got your eyes on some pretty cool things standing on either side of Jesus. That you miss Jesus himself. And he misses you. And he comes to you tonight. He clouds over the competition and says, it's just me. I will not share my glory. I'm going to take out anything that competes with me. And some of you, you, you know, I don't know what's standing on either side of Jesus. For some of you. It's, maybe it's your musical gifts, I don't know. I'm not dissing you. But maybe it's hard for you. You're like, I love the Lord, but have you seen me do a guitar solo, Joel? I'm up there in the top 3%. I don't know what it is. But I've seen a lot of those guys come and go in ministry, and it breaks my heart. Because they made it about their gift instead of the giver. About their ministry instead of the Messiah. And they fell in love the ministry of the Lord instead of the Lord of the ministry. And they got their eyes off of Jesus. And, I, you know, I love Martin Luther. I appreciate that we celebrate 500 years of Reformation. That is awesome. Don't get me wrong. And I thought it was amazing how God used him and what he did walking up to the building and that whole thing. I thought he nailed it. Sorry. But some people on Facebook, you'd think he's Jesus. Like, me and Martin. Martin I call, if he were here, I would call him Marty. Marty and me. Marty and me. I'm like, come on, buddy. He's just a guy. He's just, I mean, I had this thought yesterday when I was studying this. It blew my mind. Peter was tripping out. Moses. Elijah. 
Elijah, Moses. What was Jesus thinking? Probably like Peter, really? Moses, he killed someone and fled on foot from me. Elijah, oh, oh, right, Elijah, right. He had the whole fire thing, but then a girl called him up and freaked on him, and he fled on foot away. And Peter, guess what? At the cross, you're gonna fled on. You're gonna flee on foot. Uh, do you see the common thing? They're all people in their flesh, like you and me, that could do just wicked things, running away from the Lord. He doesn't want you to focus. Oh, how we worship people. <gasps> He's amazing. His gift. His talent in music. <gasps> wow. They're just people. It's all even foot, footing at the cross, isn't it? Amen? We, rem we need to remember this. It's all level ground at the cross. You, me, Billy Graham, we all stand there. It's not that we don't respect what others have done, but the Bible says, be no respecter of persons. Why? Because there's one, the man, Christ Jesus, that we need to have our eyes on. I'm going to invite the, the band to come up and... Uh, can you, did you guys hear that? The band? band cue the band. Cue the ba band. Band. Supposed to be on a bungee cord. Okay. Okay. But listen. <laughs> Just, weren't these guys awesome, by the way? <laughs> but don't worship them. Okay. No. All right. But <laughs> you did it. Okay. Out. Oh, okay. Security. No. <laughs> okay. But just. Just as they begin to play quietly in the background, let's take a moment and let's just bow our heads, close our, our eyes, and, and just recognize that the same Jesus who 2,000 years ago went up a hill and was transfigured in front of these guys that they got a taste of his glory it's the same Jesus who only a few days later, and this is why they couldn't camp, by the way. He's not against camping. It's the same Jesus that a few days later, if he had camped, he would have missed this. Because a few days later, he'd go up Calvary. And he'd carry the cross upon his shoulders for you. And listen, if you'd been the only person on the face of the earth, he still would have done it just for you. You know why? Because that's how much you love. That is how much you mean to Jesus. And they nailed him to that cross. And they forced a crown of thorns upon his head. He endured the cross. The Bible said, for the joy set before him. What was the joy? Two things. Obedience to the Father. And number two, are you ready? It was you. It was you. You're the joy set before Jesus. So please, please, let him be the joy set before you. He's here tonight. And I believe that he is a divine God who works in moments where that we have to willingly and willfully separate ourselves unto him. And I just ask you in the quiet of your heart right now, is there anything that's gotten on the same level as Jesus? Maybe for someone in here it's lust, pornography. Someone else, maybe it's anger. Maybe it's jealousy. Gossip, lies, theft, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but God says His word, in his word, come out from among them and be separate. It's almost his way of saying, let's just be you, me again on the mountain. I want you to see my glory to get back to your first love. He says, don't touch what is unclean in Corinthians. He says, I'll receive you if you do this. Oh, I want to receive you. And I'll be a father and you'll be my sons and my daughters again. Friends, let's enter the cloud tonight see the wonder, the glory, and the awe of God. See his glistening robe. See him seated on the throne in glory. The one who, Hebrews says, 
daily lives to intercede for you. For you. He's, what's he doing right now? He's praying for you. And he's praying for you to get right with him. And that he would remove all other idols. And come right now in this place and revive your heart. I don't care if it's the whole room. I don't even care if it's just something small. But if there's something in your life tonight, you say, I want to be closer. I want this thing gone. I want to separate myself. I don't care if it's every one of you. I'm not going to make you do anything. I'm just going to pray for you because God works in divine moments. If you want to see his glory tonight in a new way, you want to be separate. Just before we worship right now, would you just stand where you are all over this auditorium? Just stand if that's you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Just stand where you are. Yes, yes, hallelujah. If you're in this place, you say, you know, Lord, Lord, you're touching on something in my heart. I want to see your glory again. Just stand where you are. I want to pray for you. Just take a moment. Maybe it's pride. I don't know. I'm not picking on you, but maybe you're like, well, I'm not going to stand. I'm good. And God's like, well, maybe that's the problem. I want more. Do you want more of me? If that's you, just stand where you are. I want to pray for you right now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus, who for the joy set before him suffered the cross. I pray that we might see your glory right now, see you on your throne in glory. Give us a fresh glimpse of you, Jesus, tonight. We ask this for your glory, and in Jesus' name, all God's people say, amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord. God bless you guys.